Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. So anyway, of a long, after a long list of, um, of things that Paul offers in that passage in Romans 12, there's a long list of, of uh, character traits or, or things that we do that, that really a life that's pleasing to the Lord. And it's not surprising that the very first one is, is love. He says, let your love be sincere. Let it be real and authentic. And he basically says, love God and hate sin. Love God, hate sin. So that's, that's a pretty good way to live. And then he goes through this list and he says, don't be slothful. So we're going to be talking to our students next hour about not being slothful, uh, to be eager, to be, uh, be uh, you know, don't be slothful in zeal, but be passionate and be ready to love others and serve others. I'm going to talk about now what it means to love out loud. Um, when I was um, in the sixth grade, I had a crush on this girl named Karen Lenaris. And so I wanted to express my great love for her. And so I asked her to go with me. That was back in the day. I don't know what you do now. You're dating now? What happens? You know, like you're in sixth grade, you're dating somebody. You're not dating them. You don't. But anyway, we used to go with each other. Right? So I was going to ask her to go with me. So I legit, for real, did this. I wrote a note and I gave it to her, you know, and because I was really, I didn't know how to talk to girls. I'm in sixth grade. I was like scared to death. And so I had, you know, you always have the go between too, right? And so I had a friend who got the note to her and my note for real said, will you go with me? And then she could check a box like yes or no. <laughs> and uh, I'm embarrassed, but I really did that. And she said no. And um, <laughs> yeah, right. And so thank you. Thank you, Jana. Uh, I'm still getting a little sad about it today. <laughs> And I think that she said no, because I had not really up to that point had like a legit conversation with her in my life. I was scared. Then ninth grade came around and I was really, I mean, I'd grown up by that time, big time. So I asked Beth McConnell to go with me. So um, I was at her locker. I had planned it all out and it was like between class and I was at her locker and I was kind of talking and then I was just out of nowhere. I said, would you go with me? And she was kind of giggled and said yes. And then she went off to class. So we were, we were going together. I didn't know what to do next. <laughs> and I'd call her and i for real. I would call on the phone. This is back in the day, kids. Sorry, but like we didn't have cell phones. There wasn't this subculture of, of teenage communications and stuff that drives your parents crazy now, uh, where you're making all these plans. You know, Back in the day, you had to call somebody's house. And like a dad could say, uh, I don't think so, you know, and just slam the <laughs> phone on you. But I'd call and talk to her. And I would make like a little list of things to talk about <laughs> while I was talking to her. OK, yeah, because um, I mean, that just helped me out. I was having a hard time communicating, right? And, and what happens is sometimes in life, you have a hard time communicating your great love for someone else. Now, I've grown up a little bit when I don't always write notes to Stacy now. I don't, you know, talk directly to her. But um, some of us, you know, I think we're that way when it comes to expressing our love to God and expressing, gosh, his love for others in our lives. And yet we've been called to love out loud, right? Because what happens is people, you know, we don't talk about certain things. And certainly you always hear this. Don't talk about politics and religion. You don't do that. Don't go there. Like over Thanksgiving, you're in trouble, right? Or, or it, it, at the workplace. Don't talk about religion or your all kinds. And yet, as believers, we have this great news to share with others. And we are now commanded and called to share it. And yet, certain research studies and surveys show that some 60% of all believers have not shared Christ with one person in their lifetime. I mean, like really shared the gospel to understand the news, the good news that God has called us to. And so through the month, if you hadn't been here, we were talking last month about uh, what's called the, the upper room discourse. It's Jesus' final teaching through really John 14 through 17. And he's teaching, he's talking about the Holy Spirit that's going to come as he's going to leave. After he brings that teaching, he ends up being arrested. He, he, he's end up beaten, 
punished on our behalf. He's taken to the cross and he dies on Friday afternoon. And he's buried. Well, he's raised again on Sunday. He appears to his disciples and several of the eyewitnesses then would write biographies about his life. One of those was Matthew. After Christ uh, rose from the dead, he appeared not only to his disciples, but one-on-one to others or small groups, and then to more than 500 people at one time. And then in Matthew 28, we see what's called the Great Commission. And you can see it there on the screen. Jesus gives this great co-mission. Now think about this. It's the co-with, okay, the mission, with Jesus' mission. So he gives us the Holy Spirit, and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So if he has all authority, how much do we have? Well, really none. He has all. We have none. But now he says, go in my authority in you. All right. Go in, therefore, and make disciples. That's the great challenge, the great commission of all nations, baptizing them. All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's that Trinitarian uh, relationship that we enter into, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And then he says, and behold, or look, 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 listen, 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 listen. I'm going to be with you throughout it all. I'm always going to be with you. So he tells a small group, think how audacious this is, a little group of guys who've not been, you know, hardly outside of their own little spot, their own hometown, essentially. And he says, now I want you to go to all the nations of the world and share the gospel. Now, of course, we know that this is to his disciples, but this comes to us, right? And, and, and so then in Acts 1, verse 8, which is a, a verse that's really kind of central to us here at Park Cities Baptist Church. You see it all over where, where it guides our mission efforts here locally and, and beyond. He says this. So Luke uh, writes it this way. He says when, when Jesus was ascending, not only did he give the Great Commission, he gave them a strategy to the disciples. And he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Okay, so this is before his death, he was talking about this. Now, after he's risen from the grave, he says, listen, the Holy Spirit's going to come and you're going to be my witnesses. And this word, by the way, witnesses is the word in the Greek. It's martyreos, martyr. You're going to be my martyrs. You're going to die to yourself for the sake of others. And you just might die literally. And every one of the disciples, minus one, died a martyr's death. And John died on the Isle of Patmos as he was exiled as a believer. Of course, Judas died prior to that. He says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Well, that's where they were, right? So we start where you are, Jerusalem, and then Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Again, to this little group, this ragtag group of essentially uneducated uh, disciples. He says, you're going to change the world And it's going to start here and it's going to echo forth out into all the world. And so this is the calling that he's placed on our lives. And so what we're going to do is talk through this month about what it is, our role. Where do we play? You know, what role do we play in all this? And as we talk about what it means to love out loud. All right. So here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and turn uh, to Romans chapter one. Uh, Verse 14 is we're going to land and uh, we're going to look at what Paul says about our role uh, in this whole great enterprise, this great commission that we've been called to, because a great, the great commission uh, follows what's called the great commandment. The great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love God comprehensively with your life, and then the great commandment leads to the great commission that really then becomes for us a great church. That's a great church. People who love God first and love others as a result. And here's what Paul says in Romans chapter one is going to be our passage. We're going to look at these three verses and Paul helps us see three marks of a person who loves out loud. And so we're going to walk through this and I'll be teaching, uh, guiding our students through this the next hour. But in chapter one, verse 14, it says this, I am, uh, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Paul says, I am obligated. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm duty bound is what this means. I'm, I'm under compulsion. I am responsible is what he's saying. It's on me to share the gospel. And basically he's saying the, the, you know, the educated, the uneducated, all people is what he's saying. He's going really across the spectrum of, of culture. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you 
also who were in Rome. So he's writing to the people in Rome. He's probably in Corinth. He's on a missionary journey and he's writing to uh, the people in Rome. He's longing to go and share with them. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So to the Jew first means, you know, he came out, right? Jesus himself was a Jew. So to God's people, the Jews, they're going to hear the gospel. And through them, the Abrahamic covenant is going to become a reality that I'm going to bless you, Abraham, a people who are then going to bless the nations. And, we're, and this is really what Jesus is talking about. It's going to happen among the Jews first, but bam, it's going to go out and, and a blessing to all the world. For in, in it, the righteousness of God, what is it? In it, the gospel, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith or from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That faith to faith really means uh, faith from start to finish is faith. It's all about faith. And we're going to see what he means there because he says it's always been the case that the righteous shall live by faith. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about what it means to love out loud. All right. If you take notes on sermons, I'm going to give you three marks of a person who loves out loud. First, he says, I'm obligated. I want to see if these things describe you. In verse 14, I'm indebted is really probably the better translation. I'm indebted. I'm duty bound. Paul belongs to uh, to the, he sees that, that this gospel really belongs not just to him. It's not just mine. It belongs to everybody. And now that I've got it, now that I know it, I'm obligated to share this message. Now think about it. If you had news that could save someone's life, think about that. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you have a sense of obligation to share that with someone? You know, some of you have kind of heard maybe the, the illustration, what if you had the cure of cancer, right? The cure for cancer, and you just kept it to yourself. Now, you could argue that's, that's like criminal negligence, you could say. I mean, if you had the cure that could save someone's life and you didn't offer it, wouldn't you believe, wouldn't you think you're obligated to do so? You're responsible. This is what Paul's saying. I'm responsible for this. I'm obligated because I've received this great news. I was once a Jew myself, obligated to the law. I, I could never be good enough. I sought my whole life to appease God and, and to follow religion, and I couldn't get there. And now I've discovered something. And this is news to me. The world has not known this, he's saying. And now I've received it. I'm under obligation to share it. Well, not only that, he's under obligation, but he's also has this great conviction, and he says that he's eager. I love that word. Uh, Paul is, is obligated, and he's eager. And I want to ask you again, are you? Does this describe you? I am eager. This word eager, really, it means ready to go. I mean, it's enthusiastic. It means that you're prepared even. Uh, consider this, a runner who is uh, in the box and ready for the, for the gun to go off. I'm, I'm ready, so come on, fire the gun. I am hyped. I'm ready. I'm prepared. So he's obligated. He's under obligation. He's in the starting blocks. The King James says, I am ready, and, and really the idea is ready and willing. Would that describe you? Maybe for many of us, you know, I'm really challenging, and many of us are probably thinking, man, I don't know that I get the obligation piece. I don't know that I'm always eager and ready to share the gospel. And yet God has called us to do so. So what is our motivation? What is it that we're missing? Well, I could say in a word, it's love. It's love. But I think it's God's love for us that really brings about in us this great love for other people. Those who love out loud are those who are eager. Okay, they're ready. They're prepared. And they're ready, ready to go. Um, I'm motivated by God's love who then you know, allows me to love others. And the greatest gift that I can give someone is for them to understand and to have eternal life in Christ and the joy that is theirs to follow him. First Peter chapter 3, this is a verse that has meant a lot to me for lots of years. I actually built my, my doctoral work around this in the area of apologetics. Recently we had an apologetics conference here, which was awesome last weekend. And uh, here's, what, here's what Peter says. He says, but in your hearts... Honor Christ the Lord is holy. Let, let him be central in your life. Always being prepared. Another translation says, always be ready. Be ready to make a defense 
To give a defense, that word defense is the word apologia. It's a courtroom term. Be ready to give a reason to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you, this hope that you have. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. There it is. We're not seeing a lot of that these days, this gentleness and respect. What if everybody who is a believer who ends up on some crazy news channel where they're just going back and forth with each other, what if they were actually gentle and respectful? Wouldn't that kind of change the game a little bit and just bring a winsome, loving approach to others so that we might lead them and love them to Jesus? But he says, always be ready for this hope that you have. What is this hope? Um, and I love that. You know, there's a difference between hope, as we might think about it, you know, wishful thinking, and actual biblical hope. Uh, today, I understand there's a big football game this afternoon. Um, how many of you are, anybody pulling for the Patriots? Who's got the Patriots in this one? Anybody pulling for the Patriots? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> yes? Repent! <laughs> okay. Sorry, I was just waiting. I wanted that, more of that. Like, nobody. Falcons, right? I mean, come on. Let's go, Falcons. Let's win this thing. But we all know, of course, that the Cowboys are not in the Super Bowl this year. I did see where Dak ended up. He won the Offensive Player of the Year, uh, uh, rookie Offensive Player of the Year. Got Zeke up there, and he said, man, if I had a knife, I'd cut it in half. And, you know, that's pretty cool. Hand it off because we had two. How many of you think with these two rookies and the team that we have, we keep this offensive line. How many of you think that the Cowboys could win a Super Bowl, let's say, within the next five years? Anybody? Anybody think this can happen? Okay. You are hopeful and wishing that that could happen. <laughs> that has not happened yet, right? That's wishful thinking. I mean, I could argue. Like a lot can go wrong, right? I mean, the, you know, you don't know who's going to get traded off. Witten, is he going to keep playing? I mean, you could go on. Romo, where's he going to end up? But, uh, but all kinds of things could happen. That's wishful thinking. That's, just, that's not biblical hope. Hope, check it out. Paul's hope and the hope that Peter's talking about is not wishful thinking. It is the hope that we have is based on not hoping that something will happen in the future. It's what has already happened in the past. That's where our hope lies. The last time the Cowboys were in the Super Bowl was, anybody know? 1995. 22 years ago. I mean, our students weren't even alive. In their whole lifetime, they've never seen the Cowboys go to the Super Bowl. You're talking about wishful thinking. But here's the thing. Paul is saying, and Peter says here, be ready to give an answer to anyone for the hope, the certainty that you have based on what's already happened. That's the gospel. Our salvation is not based on, oh, I hope it's true. I hope that someday I'm going to go to heaven. I hope that. The... No, no, no. It's already happened. You receive it by faith. And it's certain, not based on your good works or anything that you're going to do in the future, but what Christ has already done for you. And so what I love is Paul goes on then and he says, this is why I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's not about me and my crazy life and all that I've done or even how good I am now. Instead, it's based on what Christ has already done for me. So Paul says that he's obligated. He's eager. And then thirdly, I, he says, I'm not ashamed in verse 16 and 17. He's not embarrassed. He's not, he's humbled. He's unapologetic. That's what that word means. Bold and forthright. He's not hiding. And I wonder, why was he all these things? Well, because he knew that it had already happened as a done deal. And it had changed his life. And so let's talk about it. As we close, I want to get real clear about what is, what is this gospel? Well, he tells us. See, what do we share exactly? And I could argue, well, you share your story. We all have a story if you have come to Christ. Uh, if you haven't, you don't have a story. If you have received Christ, you have a story. And here's what's beautiful about the story. Nobody can argue with your story. I mean, they can say, well, that's cool. And that happened to you, not me. That's your story. I've got another story. Okay. I mean, we can end it there, but you can't argue with my story. And if, I'm, if I have this sense of obligation, if I'm eager and passionate, if I'm ready, right? And if I'm unashamed, that catches people's attention. And that will, that will ultimately allow the spirit to speak into others' lives. So let's talk about this. What is this? gospel. He's, he's, he's obligated, eager, and we should be unashamed to share. Uh, well, first of all, it's news, right? 
And, and here's the news. It is the power of God. You see that in verse 16? It is the power of God unto salvation. That's what it is. It's the power of God. I want you to see this. this. This salvation comes from an outside source. Now, on this side of the cross, and as Christians, many of us, as believers, we're going, well, yeah, it's, it's God did this. Jesus came. He's the one who brought salvation to us. But this is news. This is big news. It was big news for Paul, and it's news for anyone who does not yet know this. This salvation comes from an outside source, and that source is God. It's not from within us. And this is big time news. He's intervened in human history to come and rescue us because we could not rescue ourselves. This is such good news. The gospel saves us from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and ultimately from the presence of sin in the end. We're going to be totally free from the presence of sin. This gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And our greatest need, of course, in our lives, and every person that you know, is peace with God. They may not know to say it that way, but they feel it, they sense it. They can't be good enough. They're, they're unforgiven and they, they, they have this shame that they live with. Every person you know, you think about people in your workplace or people you encounter, you've never locked eyes with someone for whom Jesus did not die. And he's longing for you to be the one who would love them to him. But it's not simply your love. Our love has never saved anybody. My great love is not the good news. My love can lead them and guide them to Christ, but it's news. And the news is that it's the power of God unto salvation. Then he goes on. Here it is. He qualifies it even more. It is a righteousness that comes from God. This is the big news. It's, it's, it's his righteousness, not ours. This is a radical news. And I'm telling you, friends, listen, this is radical news today in our lifetime. Even among those who claim to be believers, often, and we talk about this, the difference between cultural Christianity and then a radical biblical Christianity is this. Cultural Christianity has become a religion that bears the name of Christ. And it's essentially work hard, right? When we say it often, work harder, get better. And Jesus is going to help you do that. And you'll be blessed if you do this, this, and this, and this. That's a religion that bears his name. That's not, a go- that's not the gospel. The gospel is simply believe more deeply what he's already accomplished for you. Not what you do, but what he's already done. It's a righteousness that comes from heaven. I love this uh, in Acts 4, verse 12. This is why Peter was preaching and he says this, and there's a salvation. There is salvation in no one else. And this flies in the face of our culture today. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You know that Jesus said it. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then what did he say? No one comes to the Father but through me. That's John 14, 6. Now we hear that in our culture today. I think a lot of believers, we step back and go, man, that's kind of, that doesn't fly well. That didn't go well in our culture. This exclusive claim that Jesus made, and it seems intolerant, unloving, and all those kind of things. Listen, here's, here's the great news, is that this news, this exclusive claim, it comes only through Christ because only Christ has lived the perfect life on your behalf. This is great news. Only Christ has died on the cross, taken upon himself your punishment that should have come to you before a holy God. Because you see, God is holy and just, and he's loving. And for him to simply turn his back on sin and just say, okay, well, I'm not going to act like that never happened. That would, he would cease to be just. He would cease to be righteous. And so instead, he looks at our sin square in the face, and he says, I'm going to take care of that for you. The punishment that should come to you from a just judge instead goes to his son. Christianity stands alone. As, as the way uh, Christ stands alone as the one who's come, the righteous one who's lived the perfect life for us. And it's always been this way. This is what Paul's saying in the end is, the righteous shall live by faith. It's always been by faith. And you'll say, well, what, what, what happened in the, in the Old Testament though? It's like they had all these laws. God is revealing, Paul says in Galatians, the law became a tutor, a pedagogos for us to show us that we could not we could not be good enough. And so way back in the garden, I mean, track with me through redemptive history for a moment. Way back in the garden, Adam and Eve fall. 
And then what happens? They're exposed and they realize they're naked for the first time. Really, really interesting. And what does God do? He kills an animal and he covers them with the skin of the animal. And then you move on into redemptive history. God calls out his people. We see the Exodus, the event of the Old Testament. And in the Exodus, what happened there? Those who had uh, taken the, um, the, the blood of the lamb and had put it over the doorpost. Remember, the angel of death would come and would pass over the, the, the homes where those, uh, those people lived and they would be saved. They'd be rescued from their sin. God would make a way. And then comes Jesus. And John the Baptist would see him and he would say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So through all the sacrificial system and all that was to be done, it was always through the shedding of blood, through a sacrifice offered that God, a holy God, would be appeased. And yet we learn over time that none of those, none of those animals would fully appease a holy God. But then Christ comes. He dies on the cross for the punishment of our sin. He dies. The holy righteous one becomes sin for us and takes our sin upon the cross. We say it often here that, you know, religion and friends, listen, if you don't know this, oops, that's Allie McCorder. I'm praying for her, um, for D now. She's one of our students. Um, you know, we say it often this way, that, that religion really is, is spelled D-O. It's what you must do for God. And Christianity stands alone. It's spelled D-O-N-E. It's what Christ has already done. That's the radical difference between Christianity, I should say Christ, the gospel, and all other religions in the world. And then look at what he says finally. He says this gospel, it is received by faith. Now, we've talked about that a little bit uh, even already. He says it's from faith, start to finish, it's faith. And this is where we struggle. As I've had conversations, even recently, you get to the faith piece and it's like, oh, man, I just struggle with faith. I mean, I, that's, that's the hard part. I just, I don't know if I have enough faith, right? And I think all of us could relate to that. In varying degrees, we, we pray, Lord, help me with my unbelief. I believe, but I want to believe more. Well, what I've shared recently, I was talking to a, to a man just a couple weeks ago, and I was saying, aren't you grateful that it's faith? You know, it's like, yeah, but that drives me nuts, you know, because we all want to do something, but praise God that it's faith and not your works. You see, Christianity is, yes, it's exclusive. Praise God it's exclusive because it's Christ alone who has made a way for you but it is the greatest inclusivity of anything. You talk about, listen, religion is exclusive because religion says you must do this, 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 and this. And in Christianity, it's by faith you must believe, not do, not be good enough, but trust in Christ who is good enough for you. It's the most inclusive news anyone can hear. And praise God, it's exclusive because Christ alone has made a way. This is news, gang. And you don't have to have a doctorate. You don't have to understand all the verses. All you've got to do is be willing and ready. Because it's not your ability that leads someone else to Christ. It's not, your, you know, it's not based on, on, on your ability to get them to respond. It's the Spirit working through you. And then their response to His ability to rescue them from their sin. So we can love each other. And we can love others without any need for anything in return just to share the love of Jesus. I want to challenge you. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, it says, I'm not ashamed. This is Paul again. For I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. So I, I want to challenge you in the days to come. If you're, if you're a guest here, I hope you come back. Continue to learn with us. If you're a member and guest, everyone... Uh, is invited to be a part of a few things that I want you to be aware of, kind of a challenge of just kind of preach the announcements here for a moment. Um, we want to do this as we approach uh, through the spring, as we lead towards Easter. We're taking up a challenge that um, Lee Strobel actually gave us uh, as he spoke at our, our um, conference last weekend. I want to talk to you about how you can love out loud. First, we want you to, uh, every day uh, at 1 o'clock, we want you to pray for one person Okay, at one o'clock for one minute, 
uh, every day from now until Easter. And some of you might say, well, can I pray for more than like one person? And, okay, no, you can't do that. <laughs> one. No, I'm kidding. Okay, as God lays people on your heart, pray. But at one o'clock, set your alarm on your, on your watch. If you can do that on your, on your phone. And, uh, and set an alarm. And at one o'clock every day, pray for one person for one minute. A person that you can invite to come to Easter. A person that God would lay on your heart that you could share Christ with. Let's be intentional and, and, and walk through that. Also, I want to encourage you to go on our website. Uh, you can do this this afternoon. We've put out there a... Um, a little quiz for you. It's an evangelism quiz that you can take. It'll f- help you figure out what style you are. We're going to be talking in the weeks to come about six different styles of evangelism. Everybody is an evangelist. Every one of us who know Christ, but we, we've got to figure out, well, here's my way. That is true. This is how I'm bent. I can reach others for Christ. And it's a really cool survey. So you can go online and do that today. Um, check it out. It's easy to find on our website. And then finally, I want you to join me starting this Wednesday night. You can see it there in your bulletin. I'm going to be teaching a course called Becoming a Contagious Christian. And we're going to dive in in great detail on how we can learn how to share our faith with great confidence and in a, in a winsome and loving way. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Hope you join me Wednesday night as we dive into that for the next few weeks. All right. Okay. So, hey. Let's, uh, let's, let's love out loud. Let's don't be slothful. Don't be like the sloth, but instead uh, to, to give our hearts and our lives to others as we seek to reach them for Christ. So from the sixth grade to the ninth grade, I've grown up just a little bit. And now I, sure enough, I can express my love very clearly and openly. I love Stacy out loud and she hears it often as she loves me out loud. But you know, a lot of us, we need to just grow up. We need to grow up. And we need to be bold. We need to be like Paul. We need to understand that we're under obligation. We're eager and we're unashamed to share the gospel with others. Let's do so in the name of Jesus. Let's pray together as we close. God, thank you for uh, this word from Paul. I thank you that he's challenged us and that we also can join this great apostle to, uh, to love others as he has. Lord, what an amazing thing uh, to think that uh, from the disciples, sure enough, they did it. They did it. They, they shared the gospel. And then from them, one person to another, from one generation to another throughout 2,000 years until one day, one day the gospel came to me. And it came to each person here in this place. And now you've called us to do the same. And friend, I want you to think about the day you came to Christ. I want you to rejoice in that. People who led you to Christ. Without them, you wouldn't be here today. They loved out loud. And now you and I, were obligated to do the same. And if you don't remember a day when you received Christ, today could be your day. Just give your life to him. He died on the cross for you. Give him your life anew today. If you you don't know him, just by faith, receive his love, his grace today. We'd love to talk to you about that. Let's all express our great love for him and our need for him in our lives. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.